from my my parked car in Warrington, Virginia. I welcome you to the fourth presentation in the Wakefield Country Day School free online seminar series. My name is Paul Larner and I am chairman of the board. Our school is delighted to make available this summer via Zoom an esteemed, diverse, and fascinating group of speakers. To learn of future speakers and register, please go to wcdsva.org. Now for today's speaker and topic. Steph Ritter has been a resident of Rappahannock County for 40 years and active in our community, serving on the boards of the Child Care Learning Center, Piedmont Environmental Council, Virginians Against Domestic Violence, Virginia Women's Attorneys Association, and Virginia Working Landscapes. Steph speaks today about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, a landmark piece of legislation frequently in the news, including recently with the Supreme Court's decision issued June regarding sex discrimination in the quote Bostock case. Steph earned her BA from Harvard, her JD from the University of Virginia, and has been a lecturer at GW School of Law. WCDS is privileged to host her presentation today. I turn it over to you, Steph. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so um, what I've done in the past is, is uh, to be a legal services attorney where I represented low-income people in civil matters. And during my nine years with legal services, I, I uh, concluded that most poor people were women and children, which I know is still to be true. So when I left legal services, I thought, well, you know, what I'd like to do is to concentrate on women and the law and equality. So I worked some for the Women's Legal Defense Fund and then started teaching at GW and I taught gender discrimination, feminist legal theory, sexuality and the law, uh, family law, trust in estates, <laughs> anyway. Uh, what I wanted to do is to look at Title VII. You know, actually in doing all the, the uh, Black Lives Matter, the events and the follow through, I, I've just noticed an amazing ignorance of history. And, and so in thinking about doing this, what I thought I'd do is go back about 150 years and, and bring women and wages up to Title VII, and then I was going to talk about a, a few cases that I thought uh, were really important, or if not important, certainly interesting. So to start with, um, in terms of a history of women and wages, at common law, which is of course what was guiding the courts uh, in the 17th, 18th, and beginning of the 19th centuries, and now st and it does still somewhat. Um, when, hu when husband and wife, when they uh, got married, they, there was this very kind of romantic idea, which is when you're married, you become one person. Unfortunately for wife, that one person was husband. And the result of that was that women had no rights to own property, no rights to her own wages, no rights to enter into contracts or to bring legal action. She was said to be protected by uh, her husband in all these matters and anything she did would be under his wing and he would be responsible for it and so therefore she shouldn't do anything. Well, as the 19th century sort of progressed along and in the U.S. it frequently happened that women were left by themselves while their husbands went off, you know, to engage in other matters and, and it was extremely inconvenient for them not to be enter, uh, entering, able to enter into contracts or, or to negotiate about property or actually to own their own wages. So 
uh, starting in about the middle of the 19th century, there were a series of acts called the Married Women's Acts, Property Acts, which enabled women to enter into contracts, own property, uh, and also be entitled to their own wages. So, you know, they're, they're sort of remnants of that notion of husband and wife uh, being one, that being husband. I know that when I was in law school, it was still presumed that if you had a joint banking account that, that all, the, the, all the money will actually belong to the husband. And um, if it was considered that the wife had any, it was only to defraud his creditors. So it was always presumed that any money that was put into that uh, joint account were, were actually his. Uh, that's actually since been changed, but there, and the other, of course, if you buy property in your husband and wife, you own as tenants by the entirety, each person owning all. Although in theory, uh, it's more equitable now than it was in the 19th century. So during the, um, okay, so by the turn of the century, women are in fact entitled to their wages. And of course their wages are less than men. And the theory was that there was no reason to make women's wages or women in general equal to men because women were queen of the house and men were kings of the marketplace. It was like apples and oranges. There's really no reason to treat them equally because they're not the same. And, and that was the guiding principle for especially the, uh, the Supreme Court um, on matters of, say, equal protection. There's a famous case where uh, Michigan had a statute which said that women could be waitresses, but they couldn't be bartenders. And they could be waitresses in the same bar. They just couldn't be bartenders unless, unless the woman was married to the the owner of the bar and, and then she could bartend. But, and the, and the uh, reason according to Michigan for this was that it, it uh, was upholding the morals of the state, which is obviously an irrational reason uh, for having somebody actually serving liquor, but not actually being able to pour liquor. But the Supreme Court bought that because it was scrutinizing the the uh, gender the gender classification on on the lowest level of the rational basis, even though that could hardly be considered rational. So in 1964, that that was kind of the status until 1960, the 1960s, and in 1964, when Congress was considering Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The, the thrust of that act was to provide some kind of um, protection for African Americans in particular, to provide, you know, to require private employers to hire and to treat equally people of color. And there is no way any of the people who were supporting that bill would have wanted to include sex because it didn't occur to anybody that you couldn't discriminate on the basis of sex because after all, women were the queen of the, of the house and men were the king of the marketplace. And so there was no need to treat women equally. Um, so, how did it happen that Title VII included sex in one of the in one of the categories for uh, uh, prohibitions? What happened was uh, there was a congressman who was actually from uh, from Fauquier County. His name was Judge Howard Smith, and I can remember my mother particularly disliking this man. Uh, he was head of the very powerful House Rules Committee, and he would stymie, block, do whatever he could to, to stop any kind of civil rights action, and had done that all during the 50s and was planning to do it 
all the way uh, through the 60s if he could have. So, uh, and he had, was head of a, a coalition of uh, congressmen that were called the anti-civil rights coalition. So he's a guy who comes in and says, you know, I'd like to make a little amendment to this bill. And uh, that little amendment was to include sex in the list of categories uh, that were going to be protected by the, the Civil Rights Act. And you know, the guy who was um, managing the bill was completely upset because he thought as did Smith, that what, that what the addition of sex to the list of categories would do would be to overload the bill and that it wasn't going to, and it wouldn't pass. And at the time, there were a coalition of bipartisan women, I think about six of them, uh, who put pressure on all of their colleagues uh, to, to pass the bill with the addition of sex in the list of categories. So it passed. And having passed, they thought, well, wait a minute, <laughs> what do we mean by sex? You can't discriminate on the basis of sex. One of the things was, you know, in the 60s and then also in the 50s and all the way through the mid 70s, if you looked in the newspaper, what you'd see is lists of jobs that were men's jobs and women's jobs. I mean, I can remember that in law school. You know, there was just no, the, the idea that you couldn't discriminate on the basis of sex just seemed absurd to everybody, but nevertheless, it was in the bill. In fact, up to me, is just mind boggling. I mean, it's amazing to me that it got passed in the 60s. And, you know, I just wonder if it would be passed now, given the Republican Senate, but never mind. What it says is that it shall be an unlawful employment practice for an employer to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individuals or otherwise to discriminate against any individual with respect to his compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals' race, color, religion, sex or national origin. So, I mean, the, 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 you have two things going on there. One, the notion that you couldn't discriminate on the basis of sex if you're a private employer just seemed absurd. But of course, the other part is that in uh, the notion that you couldn't discriminate on the basis of sex, of, of race, uh, was beyond the ken of a lot of private employers, especially in the South. So uh, the fact that this got passed is, is still amazing to me. You really have to hand it to Lyndon Baines Johnson for all the things that he may not have done well. This was, this was amazing. So um, in thinking about how sex was going to, how this was all going to play out with respect to sex, one of the things that Congress, you know, there, there are all these old congressmen sitting around thinking, oh my God, you know, there's no way that my father who's in a nursing home is going to want to have a male nurse. So there's got to be some, you know, there's got to be something about only women can be nurses or something. So what they do is they put this section in, which is called bona fide occupational qualification. And this is a defense, you know, if you're an employer, and you really, really want to discriminate on the basis of sex or actually for this one, national origin or religion, um, you can do so if the, um, if the discrimination, if you absolutely have to have a woman for the job or a man for the job. So it has to be critical or essential to um, the main purpose of the, of the business to be able to discriminate. I think of that as being like sperm donor. It's okay to advertise for a man if you're running a sperm bank. That would be one of the few exceptions that I could think of. But you can imagine that for, you know, the first bunch of cases, it was you know, everything from nurses to uh, you know, doctors have to be men or uh, 
there were just a whole slew of kids. One of my favorites actually was a case called, uh, which was Southwest, uh, Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, it was about to go bankrupt and it came up with a great marketing idea, which was since their, their main clientele were businessmen and they actually flew out of Love Field in, in uh, Texas, they decided they would be the Love Airline. And so their whole marketing was about, oh, someone up there in the sky loves you in addition to, you know, God. And, and, and their, their stewardesses were dressed in like this skimpiest or most outrageous outfits. And they served drinks with the love, uh, <laughs> love stirs and stuff. And, and their business just went skyrocketing. You know, everybody wanted to go on the Love Airlines with these spectacularly beautiful stewardesses. And then sure enough, some guy comes along and says, he wants to be a steward on the Love Airline. And Love Airlines says, no way, you know, if we let men be stewards, then, you know, the essence of our business is going to be destroyed because we're going to go back into bankruptcy. And the court said that actually the essence of a stewardess's or steward's business is to help to sell, safely transport passengers from point A to point B. It really doesn't matter uh, whether or not they're, uh, you know, there's nothing about that, that job that requires that women only do it. And so I don't know if you, the next, the next time I noticed the Love Airlines, they, they were all dressed in these zookeeper outfits, which were totally gender neutral. And they had their, their uh, planes or corpuses and stuff. Anyway, they, they lost that suit then. And, um, and increasingly bona fide occupational qualification falls into the categories that I think of it as where, you know, like sperm donor, wet nurse, the kinds of things where you, it is kind of hard for someone of, of the other sex uh, to perform the duties that are essential to the job. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> the next one, the first case actually to go before the Supreme Court, one of the things that happened with, with uh, Title VII in the sex category <clears throat> was nothing happened. You know, no, uh, nobody's, nobody was really picking up on on litigating that part of Title VII and so, you know, until the women's movement uh, in the late 60s and, and 70s. So uh, in 1971, the first case comes before the Supreme Court. And that case is a case called Phillips versus Martin Marietta. And Mrs. Phillips was applying for a job and 70 to 75 percent of the job applicants were women 75 to 80 percent of the people who were hired were women but she didn't get the job and she didn't get the interview because she had preschool age children so women with preschool age children could not apply for the job, the reason being that the, the business thought, well, if you have preschool age children, you're gonna be missing a lot of work, you're gonna to have to bring the kid into work, you're gonna to have to, you know, because women are the primary caretakers, they're gonna miss a lot of, of time at work. And, and Martin Marietta couldn't, couldn't figure out, or, what the, you know, their defense was, look, are you kidding me? Where's the sex discrimination? We've got, you know, 70 to 75% of the people who apply are women. We hire 75 to 80% of the women who, you know, of our total workforce are women. So where's the sex discrimination? And to its credit, the Supreme Court said, the reason the sex discrimination is, is an individual sex discrimination. It's that this individual, Mrs. Phillips, 
doesn't get a chance to be either interviewed or hired because she has school-aged children or preschool-aged children. A man who has preschool-aged children gets to be interviewed and probably gets to be hired. So there's your discrimination. Now, that was the first case to come before the Supreme Court that sort of basically said, you know, you can't use all these averages uh, in order to defeat a Title VII suit. If the person, the individual is being discriminated against on the basis of sex, then uh, you have a prima facie Title VII case. The next, uh, what's sort of, what's, What's developed is that there are two ways of bringing a Title VII suit. One is what's called disparate treatment, which is when you have an individual or a group of individuals who are intentionally discriminated against on the basis of sex. And, um, and they can prove that by showing, as Mrs. Phillips did, that, um, you know, that men were hired and she wasn't in uh, for a reason having to do with her sex. The other kinds of cases are called disparate impact, and that's when you have a neutral policy which disparately impacts a protected group. And a uh, case of like, for instance, if uh, let's say I have a laundry, um, I run a laundry, and I would really like for everybody to um, be able to lift a hundred pounds in my laundry. That's not, it's not going it's in fact, not essential to the job. And the fact is that most women can't lift that hundred pounds, you know, routinely um, at the laundry. So, it's a neutral, you know, it's, it's a neutral policy which disparately impacts a protected group. Now, if I can show that you actually have to do, you actually have to lift that 100 pounds, uh, then I can probably still have that neutral policy. But if all it does is serve to, to basically um, discriminate against women then with and it's not being upheld for any real valid reason then um then i have a discrimination suit for which they're defending you know, the, the defense for the employer is that actually you know we need people to lift 100, 100 pounds <laughs> there was a case again uh against the airlines say so wait the uh, requirement for being a pilot was that you had to be 5'8". And of course, most women weren't 5'8". So even though had, they had all the training and were otherwise qualified, the airlines were saying, well, you know, you're just not tall enough to, to drive this airplane. All they had to do was to make airplanes that could accommodate women who were you know, <laughs> shorter than 5'8", which it, they did. Uh, because the courts found that that was discriminatory, that the neutral policy had a discriminatory impact, uh, and it could be fairly easily remedied. The next group of cases that um, were the, the Title VII sort of ran or ran into a, a block on the uh, because of the, uh, on the basis of sex were cases having to do with pregnant women and uh, the supreme court in its wisdom in 1974 in a case that was actually an equal protection case uh, it's called gedilde versus aiello and california had a a um, insurance scheme where they covered all disabilities except for court adjudicated dipsomania and pregnancy. And um, so the women who were pregnant and were not being covered by the short-term disability plan brought suit and the court said that really this is not, you know, under equal protection needed to get in a protected category so that they're saying this is discrimination on the basis of sex. And the court said, 
No, it's not discrimination on the basis of sex because they're pregnant persons and non-pregnant persons. So for, um, for the purposes of the court under equal protection, that, that holding is still there, pregnant persons, non-pregnant persons. They did the same thing for a case that was brought under Title VII, a case called Gilbert versus General Electric. General Electric had, you know, had a similar insurance scheme where they covered just about everything. Volunteer, um, uh, cosmetic surgery, um, they did uh, <coughs> all kinds of uh, gender-specific operations for mostly men, <laughs> and then they failed to cover pregnancy. So the scheme was basically this, that the insurance covered everything that a man would encounter during his work life, and, you know, uh, any kind of illness or surgery, and it covered everything for women that a man might also encounter. But the one thing that women were most likely to encounter, which is pregnancy, they didn't cover it. So the argument being that was not was not equal protect. It wasn't that they were not uh, covered uh, to the extent that men were covered. Uh, but the court once again said non-pregnant persons and pregnant persons. There's no sex discrimination here. So all these women got together. Uh, in the late 70s and ran up to the hill and said, wait a minute, you guys, if there's one thing that sort of is core to, to women's gender identification, it's the ability or inability to get pregnant. I mean, there's breastfeeding too, but pregnancy is like a big one. So we think actually that you should change the law to reflect the fact that when you discriminate on the basis of pregnancy what you're doing is discriminating on the basis of sex because as we know only women get pregnant until until the future i suppose but so what the congress did was to say okay you know we buy that we can see actually that you have a point here uh, it does seem like pregnancy might be gender related. So they passed something which is called the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. And the Pregnancy Discrimination Act says that, you know, if you discriminate on the basis of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, uh, then you are discriminating on the basis of sex. You know, and people that, um, and people uh, who are, there we go, that's the, um, and uh, that people who are pregnant or uh, going through childbirth or are affected by pregnancy related conditions shall be treated the same for employment related purposes as other persons not so affected, but similar in their ability or inability to work. So if you have a, an insurance plan in, in your workplace that covers, you know, heart attacks, everything else, then you also have to have one, then it has to cover pregnancy. That's what the PDA says. However, if you don't have an insurance, you know, any kind of, medical insurance plan in your workplace then obviously you don't have to cover pregnancy but which came to, which brought up the next problem the next problem was that there was a woman by the name of mrs gara and she was employed by a california savings and loan and she got pregnant and she um she was asked to leave her place of work. And so she left her place of work. And at the time, uh, California had a mandatory maternity leave act, which required employers to give employees, I think it was six weeks of time off and to save their job for them so that when they came back from childbirth and the weeks after childbirth, they would still have 
some job a job with that employ that employer well california savings and loan you know threw up its hands says, oh my god you know we don't know what to do because we don't provide uh we don't provide coverage for uh people who have you know we don't provide disability coverage of any kind or medical coverage uh, for people who get heart attacks and so on and so forth. Uh, so we don't think we should have to comply with this mandatory maternity leave act. So the, the issue is are women who, because of the mandatory maternity leave act, are they being treated better than men who work at the same establishment? I mean, this, in this case, you know, just blew the women's, um, the legal community apart because everybody wanted to have have uh, pregnancy covered under you know some you know they wanted people to be able to leave their job and have a baby and come back because no matter what if you're there's one day you are going to miss at work and that's the day you're delivering that baby and probably a few days after so what was happening, of course, to, to women was as soon as they got pregnant and had, you know, had to leave the, for childbirth, uh, they were losing their jobs. And that, of course, um, happened to many, many women. And so the women's community didn't want to argue that, oh, yeah, well, you have to comply with the PDA, which says you may not discriminate on the basis of pregnancy, et cetera, because if you require if you required uh california savings and loan for pregnancy you know to provide a job for somebody a, a time off in a job uh, when they get back because for somebody who delivered a baby and taken care of it afterwards then you'll be giving that person special treatment because the guy who's had the heart attack He's just going to lose his job. Chris, the answer, the one I argued to the Supreme Court and did not win on, uh, was, well, the easy answer is provide medical coverage for everybody on everything. I and mean, that's the obvious answer, right? So, but, so there was this big split in the women's community between the so-called equal treatment folks, the guys who say, well, no matter what, you know, you have to treat people equally. And if men don't get it, then women shouldn't get it. And then the other group that said, look, you know, are you crazy? Uh, if we don't cover, you know, if we don't cover pregnancy and related conditions, if we don't provide some kind of time off for women and uh, uh, a guaranteed job when they come back, then we're, we're doing a really uh, huge disservice to women and we're going to, they're going to be forever low page wage uh, wage earners and uh, they'll never get be able to get ahead which was a terror it was in fact a, a terrible dilemma what the court ended up saying was to you know part of it so it was so disingenuous of uh, cal fed to be saying oh poor us what can we do we're stuck between the mandatory maternity leave act and the pregnancy discrimination act when in fact, they could have solved the whole problem by, you know, being, <laughs> being uh, uh, conscientious employers and providing health care for all their workers. But the Supreme Court said, you know, look, there's a, there's a floor below which uh, the, uh, you, you cannot get, you cannot go. The, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act is not going to keep employers from adhering to a mandatory maternity leave act that you can you know we they we're supposed to be you know, the whole idea of title seven is to try to give uh, women an equal chance in the workplace and if if you you don't allow this kind of accommodation for women uh then you're you're going to keep them you know again as low wage earners. And then the ultimate solution uh, was, of course, the Parental Leave Act, which was gender neutral. So both men and women can take time off 
to take care of their kids. Of course, women are still the ones giving birth and they're losing that day at work. <laughs> um, so then I guess, it's, am I running out of time? Okay, I'm running out of time. Uh, I'll do one more case just to bring you up to, to, uh, to the moment, which is Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia. This is the case where the Supreme Court it, and uh, Judge Gorsuch wrote the opinion, says that uh, when an employer discriminates against homosexuals and transsexuals, it is discriminating on the basis of sex. You know, what's amazing to me is that the, the uh, this, there's been a group of women, including uh, especially High Feldblum, who've been making this argument since 1984 that when you just you know that the courts have got to use title seven to cut to protect uh gays and and uh trans transsexuals because they're being discriminated against on the basis of sex and it's amazing to see that gorsuch finally buys the the argument you know how many years later but it's also the uh, conservative you know the you, the, the tr traditional response is what you see in the dissent. Said, oh, it's discrimination on the basis of homosexuality or sexual orientation. Uh, it's not discrimination on the basis of sex. And Gorsuch is saying, yes, it is discrimination on the basis of sex because, you know, if you're a man and you choose to have a partner who is a wife, I mean, uh, who is a woman, uh, then you're not going to be discriminated against. However, if you choose a partner who is a man, then you will be discriminated against and isn't that on the basis of sex and then of course the the transsexual ones are it seem clearly to be on the basis of sex although a lot of courts have had trouble with that too which you know you start the job as a man and you're transitioning to be a woman so you've changed sex during the course of your employment which you know the discrimination is on the basis of what sex right okay so that, I'm going about 10 minutes over my time. Does anybody have any questions? Steph, Thoughts? this is, thank you very much. We're, we're open for questions. I know I have one, but I'll let somebody else proceed. Sexual harassment is also covered under Title VII. Okay, let me, let me ask you, Steph, Maybe you're yeah. familiar with the history of the passage of the 1964 Act, and I'm just curious how hotly contested its passage was. You mentioned it was, a, I guess, a feat of um, engineering by, by Johnson, but I'm curious, was its passage hotly contested and very contentious in its time? Yeah, no, I think it was, you know, people have been trying to get uh, civil rights acts passed for, you know, since the beginning of the 50s and then, and probably before that. And, uh, you know, the idea that you could tell a private employer, I know you have to have 15 or more employees, that you cannot discriminate on the basis of race. I mean, it was really, you know, it, that was totally anathema to most of the Southern legislators. And uh, they had managed to stop and kill every, you know, every piece of legislation. And so that went in. And I think the fact of, I mean, you had the, the uh, March on Washington and then um, Robert Kennedy's death, I think that that was enough impetus to push it over. Paul, do you have a do you do you have a, a thought about that or no? Hi, Steph. Um, I I, I don't know. Hey, um, thank you. This is a great presentation. So timely and um, so relevant. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have I, uh, me. Yeah. Pardon? Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's, I'm so glad you said that because we we should watch what the media says about Camilla Harris 
you know, watch that's, words for sex, stereotyping. Oh my God, that's, you know. That's my, that was my question. Yeah, yeah please, <laughs> please comment on that. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. You know, I think there was actually a, a group letter that went out a few days ago from a, 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 several women's organizations to the media saying, look, you guys, just be careful here because you tend to stereotype and discriminate on the basis of sex. You know, watchwords are aggressive woman, shrill, what's she wearing? How does she get along with the people she works with? You know, the, uh, the, the all the classic things. Does she smile too much? Does she smile too little? You know, shrill, I love that one. <laughs> school marmish you know there are a list of them that uh, we can we can await it's it is it's an amazing moment i think i i'm i'm so happy i think that i think she's a, a good she's so smart and it'll be yeah. uh Dr. unlike like, unlike the two previous i mean well so she's been thoroughly vetted um the last the last woman um, who was, you know, nominated for vice president or ran on the ticket was Sarah Palin. I don't think she was well vetted. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, I think Pam, uh, Kimmel Harris is ironclad. Yeah, kind of. Except that, I know, you know, dude. Sex discrimination is alive and well in the United States. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely, and every, every, uh, you know, even even the most, even the most progressive um, men have that that uh, bias, that um, un implicit. Bias. Well, yeah, we. Um, so right. that's a good, you know, yeah. and yeah, we all have we all have, race. Race. We all have a race of bias. Yeah. Um, and whether yeah, it's yeah. women or people of color or science or arts, <laughs> uh, we we all have it, and it's really important to, and you know, in my opinion, to study, to, to try and face what you you know face your and root it out and whatever you could. And actually one of the best um, sites I found was Harvard uh, Implicit Bias. You can take a test um, yeah. online. Have, are you familiar with this stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I've, I've done it, but they're also, um, I've seen a lot of them on race where mm -hmm. high school students are hooked up to uh, those brain things and and they flip through high school yearbooks and you have these students who are saying you know i don't discriminate on the basis of race and they register fear every time they see a black face you know it's uh and yeah for women it's Right. Well, I, I, I urge, you know, everybody on this uh, call to go to the Harvard website and you have to, you sign up and you sign up for a different, um, you, you, you sign up for, you, you want to, uh, so, so the test I took or the, um, was the, the survey was, uh, do you think women are better at art and humanities and men are better at science? So I took the test and you have to, uh, they, you have to, you know, give per permission to, um, uh, to, to the testers to, you know, own your results. So I thought, I, I think, I don't, I don't believe that I will, I'm biased about this, where women are better at arts and humanities and men are better at sciences. I believe that women are as equally as capable. Um, and I took the test and uh, it wasn't the case. I have this implicit bias that women are better at the arts and humanities. Uh, so I was just like, you don't even know that you don't know what you don't know. And right. um, so uh, it's, I, it's, it's a fascinating and it's an important um, uh, pl uh, place of uh, self-study. 
I think that um, it, yeah, well, we we all grew up with role models, right? Mm -hmm. Hard to overcome that. I mean, those, you know, what women are supposed to do and what men are supposed to do. I always thought having gay marriage was going to free us all. So I'm awaiting that moment. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure how to ask questions. Uh, Greg, you have to unmute. Were you asking? You um, I did. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, if if you can hear me, uh, is yeah. is the law now settled or? Or are there new frontiers to be explored and advanced to protect women further or anybody further? I don't think the law will ever be settled. I think, you know, the, um, the, I, I actually think the passing the equal, uh, the equal rights amendment will have an impact that uh, the, the ways in which, for instance, you know, maybe we'll finally overturn um, the case which says they're pregnant persons and non-pregnant persons. Uh, and uh, then we'll finally get to why there is such wage, you know, a wage discrimination. If you look at any category uh, of profession, you know, doctors, lawyers, librarians, nurses, men always wear, they, they earn more than women in every single category, except maybe nurses. And I'm not even sure about that. I haven't seen the most recent ones. And the question is why? And, you know, as you look at it, of course, then African-American women earn less than white women and Hispanic women earn less than African-American women. So. The discriminate, there's lots, there's much to work on. Right, Dan? Hi, Steph. Hey, Nan. Uh, yes, hi. <laughs> uh, thank you for your, uh, thank you for the session today. I, I learned a lot. And I used to work in Title VII, but I still learned a lot today. And uh, particularly the historical uh, overview in reference to, um, you know, uh, how things were before, <laughs> how things were for women. Um, and the uh, Married Women's Act, I had, did not have that information. And also uh, bona fide occupation qualification, all of, all of that was uh, quite interesting. So again, thank you for thank you for today. I don't have a specific question, but thank you uh, for the session today. It was really uh, really uh, informative. Thank you. thank you. So Steph, I agree. This was great. Let me let me just partially answer Greg's question. I'm sure you'll agree with me. The real area of uncertainty in the law in this area is how far the court's going to go in creating exceptions for religious employers like Hobby Lobby and others to. Yeah. Really good point. Both their religious Excellent. beliefs to discriminate against women or against gay people or whoever. And the court has yeah. seems loaded for bear on that issue, although we will we'll find out more over the next few years. Yeah, no, no question. I mean, the, 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 the extension of the ministerial exception is just like, it's unbounded. Um, so the, the, the question ultimately becomes, will Title VII have any impact on on anything like a religious institution. I have so, another you know, question of time. What about the, the churches, the Catholic churches? A woman can't be a priest. Yeah, well, that's that religious exception, you know, exception or exemption, you know, the, the, the uh, Religious institutions are protected from complying with the Civil Rights Act. Uh, 
and the, what the recent court is doing is expanding that exception rather than narrowing it. It really? used to be that if you weren't, you know, if you weren't a minister, if you actually weren't ministering to the people, if you were, for instance, a teacher, uh, and uh, you just taught um, English or math or something in a religious school, then you would have the protection of Title VII. That's not at all clear anymore. In fact, I think that the most recent court cases indicate that you, you won't have that protection. So that's a... Thank you. Yeah. That's something to watch, actually. It'll be, it'll be interesting. Yeah, then all these protections for uh, uh, gay people, they're, they're going to run into the same problem and already have. And of the court seeing a religious exemption to having to comply. Thank you for the question. Well, well, Steph, thank you for a. Thank you. Bob timely and particularly timely now presentation we can all uh, tune on I guess Fox and see whether we can get five minutes into it without an example of <laughs> we could, uh, 15 minutes more on MSNBC but look thank you for a, a very informative uh, talk and um, next week we'll be back on a more mundane but nonetheless important interesting topic of real estate in Rappahannock County. Oh yeah, thank that's you. a good one. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Steph, with, and thank you. With, uh, oh. yeah, Sherry. Thank you very nice to see you. Bye bye. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks, Steph. Thank you, Nan. Didn't want to miss it. <laughs>